Hi, my name is Stephen Haunt and welcome to this lightning talk on hashing passwords safely. I am a Microsoft MVP, an author with Pluralsight and also run a training company called Stephen Haunt's Training. When it comes to storing passwords, we typically use a technique called hashing. Now hashing is kind of like the kind of digital equivalent of taking a fingerprint of a piece of data. So you have a piece of data, you run it through a hashing algorithm and that gives you a unique code called the hash code or a bit like our digital fingerprint. If you then go and change any of the data in that original uh, block of data, run it through the hash code again, or the hash function again, you'll get a completely different hash code out of the other end. Not just slightly different, but completely different, even if you change just one bit. When we compare this to something like encryption, encryption's a two-way operation. So you have an encryption key that you use to encrypt some data and use that same key to decrypt the data, hence the two-way nature of it. But with hashing, it's one way only. So we have a piece of data, we hash it with a hash function, and then off the back of that, you cannot go back the other way from that hash code to get back to the original uh, piece of information or the original piece of data. Hashing has several vulnerabilities um, that can be used against it. So the first one is what's called a brute force attack. So if you have a password that's been hashed and then stored in a database, an attacker might just try you know, millions and millions or even billions of combinations of passwords until they get one which matches the hash that's been stored. Uh, this is relatively easy to do these days using tools like Hashcat, uh, which you can download for free. Another type of attack is called a rainbow table or dictionary attack. And this is where you have a huge pre-computed um, dictionary of passwords and their hashes. So what you'd need to do is you take the hashed password, you'd check it in the dictionary, and if it was in there, it will tell you what that password was. Now these dictionary files are multiple gigabytes in size, and you can freely just go and download them off the internet. So that's another quite a, you know, a big potential attack vector against a hashed password. If you're trying to convince your management teams about the importance of effective um, password hashing, then a really good tool to use is something called crackstation.net. Uh, which you can see in the screenshot on the screen. So here in the grey box on the left, we have a hashed password. And then once you've typed in a capture code and then clicked cracked hash, you can see that the hash code was a SHA-256 style hash and that the password was secret 69. So this behind the scenes is using a dictionary to reverse engineer that hash back into a password. A common technique to try and mitigate against doing effective dictionary attacks against passwords is to do what is called a salted hash. Now what this means is you take your password and then you take a piece of random data called a salt and then you append it to the password and then you hash the password. That means that you then need to store that hashed password and that salt in your database because you need the same salt to be able to hash the same password again or get the same hashed result. Now this is much more effective and Tip, you know, it is a very common approach that's used by a lot of systems today to hash passwords. But the problem is, with Moore's law and the fact that CPUs and GPUs are getting so much faster, what might be a safe password and salt combination today, you know, you, you have no idea what it's going to be like in five years or ten years' time. And those passwords could well be compromised because machines are just so powerful that they can t check lots of different salt spaces. So what we have next then is another technique called a password based key derivation function and it sounds quite complicated but actually it's really not so this is just like the next evolution of password hashing so what we have here in the light blue box is what's called a pbkdf2 a password based key derivation function and like in the previous example we have a password that we want to hash and we also have a salt so that's exactly the same as what we just looked at but we also pass in a number of iterations value so what this means is that password is going to get hashed multiple times depending on that number. So if you pass in 10, then that password gets hashed 10 times. If you pass in 50,000, it gets hashed 50,000 times. Now in .NET, if you're a .NET developer, we have a class built into the library to do this. And we'll look at that in a moment. But it doesn't really matter if you're using .NET, Ruby, Python, Java, or any of the other um, development languages out there. They're all going to have either an implementation of a PBKDF2 or something similar, something called bcrypt, which internally uses a different algorithm, but actually is pretty much the same 
um, theory is what we have with PPKDF2. So let's look at this in terms of .NET. So in .NET we have a class called RFC2898 derived bytes. Bit of a bizarre name, you know, ordinarily if, you, if you're not familiar with RFC numbers and you saw that in the documentation, you'd be forgiven for skipping over it. But the RFC2898 is actually the name of the spec that's been given to this technique for password hashing. So actually this name does exactly what it says on the tin. It is implementing RFC2898 to derive a series of bytes. So we look at the example then. So we have a method called hash password, and into that we pass in a byte array, which is our data to be hashed, or byte array of our password. We pass in a byte array of our salt, which is going to be a randomly generated number, or just a random piece of entropy. And then we have the number of iterations value. So what we do is we instantiate the RFC2898 derived bytes class. We pass those three pieces of data in, and then we call get bytes and we pass in 20. And then that returns us a byte array with our hashed password. So when we call that get bytes, it's actually doing that hash multiple times based on that number of iterations. Now the reason we pass 20 into this is because internally the RFC2898 derived bytes is using a hashing algorithm called SHA1. Now SHA1 gives you a 20 byte um, hash code out the back of it. So there's no point in deriving more bytes than that because actually only the first 20 bytes is going to contain our hashed password. Now if we look at the graph on the screen here, so this is just an example. So in the table, you know, we have number of iterations, and I might say typically take take two milliseconds. And then we have a thousand iterations, which might take sixteen milliseconds. Ten thousand iterations takes one hundred ninety six milliseconds. Right the way up to five hundred thousand iterations, which might take say seven. Now these were real timings, but I produced this graph quite a few years ago um, on a quite an old laptop. So if you used to try with those iterations now, you know they'll be a lot quicker because obviously machines and laptops are a lot more powerful but the graph just gives you you know that kind of illustration that the longer or the higher the number of iterations you pass in the longer the hashing function is going to take now the reason why this is good and why we want to use this as a technique is because if you're using a tool like hashcat which can test you know millions or even billions of password combinations a second what we're doing here is we're algorithmically slowing down that hashing process so Instead of testing billions of combinations a second, you might only be able to test 100, or 5, or even 1, depending on how slow that process is. So it's actually a very good technique for slowing down the hashing process. Now you may notice on some websites, when you type in your password, uh, it might feel like there's a good 2 or 3 second delay before anything happens. So the chances are they're doing something like a PBKDF2 behind the scenes, or they're doing something uh, like bcrypt, which, you know, Fundamentally, it's the same, or that uses a different algorithm internally. Now, what I want to finish up on here is that if you have a system already where you've you know, you've implemented a logon provider and you have lots of hash passwords, you may be thinking, well, how do I upgrade all of my people onto this new password scheme? So, different techniques I've used in the past. So, one is to invalid the way you can invalidate individual users. Now, this might be um, that as an admin of the system, you could say, right, this person has to upgrade their passwords. So you set like a dirty flag on their passwords. So the next time they log in, they're forced to re-enter a new password, which means you rehash it using the new scheme. Now, you could have a blanket policy where, you know, for anyone that hasn't upgraded, the next time they log in, it automatically logs them. So you kind of get like a gradual upgrade. Or you could just have a, a way where you just invalidate everyone's flags at once and then you know, you send out an email saying they need to log in or the next time they log in, it just automatically forces everyone to upgrade. So it's something you do need to bear in mind. So if you have got a salted hash system and you want to upgrade it to a PBKDF2, you do need to think about kind of the migration path that people are going to go to. Okay, so thanks for listening uh, to this very short lightning talk. Um, if you are a Pluralsight subscriber, um, I have a course on there called Practical Cryptography in .NET, uh, which talks about you know what we discussed today, but kind of the whole gamut of um, cryptography techniques that are available in the .NET framework. Um, the course hasn't been upgraded just yet for .NET Core, but everything is still completely relevant, so nothing has really changed that drastically between .NET Framework and .NET Core, so it's all completely valid. 
So with that, thank you very much. Um, okay, as I say, you can find me uh, on plural sites. Um, I have a blog at www.stephenhaunts.com. And you can also find me on Twitter at Stephen Haunts. Thank you very much.